Moderating today's discussion is probably the person in this room that I've known the longest, Steve Clemens, uh, going back to when I was at the German Marshall Fund. Steve is the Washington editor-at-large for The Atlantic and editor-in-chief of Atlantic Live. Uh, he is a regular in the Washington think tank community and in many ways the hub of it. Uh, he worked previously as executive vice president of the New America Foundation, where he founded the American Strategy Program and continues to serve as a senior fellow today. Uh, Steve, the great. floor is Bill, yours. Thank you very much. You know, I, I am so happy to be here. There's so many great people here, good people, and I'm one of those journalists that tends to thrive in darkness and cynicism. So <laughs> today is very good for my soul. I want to thank uh, all of you uh, and the innovators that are here. I don't know, where's Sam Owen? Sam, Sam, great idea. I'm not subject to motion sickness, but everyone I know in my family and people I drive around is. But once you get that solved, I have a pet problem with motion sickness that I think will also uh, be a good opportunity for you. Uh, but it, it, it's really been, you know, uh, uh, I, I think talking about the subject that we're all going to have a conversation, we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves, and then with all of you, uh, to think through this question about entrepreneurship. And I'm going to be uh, tough. You know, Lenny Mendonce is my friend. You didn't bring me a beer. Uh, I have been to the Half May, uh, Moon Bay uh, Brewery where he's got just an awesome place. I, how many of you have been out to Lenny's place out there where the Mavericks are? You have been, right? Isn't it awesome? It's great. Um, but I think this question about the ecosystem of innovation, wealth creation, sort of dynamism in an economy, and I just want to be blunt, the story for me here today is not all the feel-good stories. It's the question of what's wrong with the economy today? Why isn't it performing in the way it was? Why aren't innovators producing the kinds of jobs they were? And what are uh, all of you, uh, led uh, by this by this. Uh, 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 important report and commission led by Steve Case and Carly Fiorina going to do about it. So, Steve and Carly, why don't I just invite the two of you to paint for me, you know, answer my question, what is wrong with the economy and what do we need to post haste solve in terms of getting into a much healthier ecosystem than we have today? Well, you know, first of all, I want to thank everyone for being here and thank in particular uh, our innovators, such an inspiring set of presentations, truly. And I think those presentations, um, if I may, before I answer your question of what's wrong, and there are a lot of things wrong, remind people of what's right about innovation and entrepreneurialism. The first thing I would say, and it has been illustrated beautifully by these presentations, innovation is the source of problem solving. Innovation is the source of improved and improving lives. And so it's important that the innovation engine works. What's also important to realize is that while we frequently hear about the innovations from very large companies, you know, when I was at Hewlett Packard, we generated 11 patents a day. Wow, that sounds really great. But the truth is that more innovation comes out of small companies. In fact, Small companies, individual entrepreneurs, innovate at seven times the rate of big mm. companies. And in some ways, that's a somewhat predictable, because what happens in a big company is you've got lots of rules and lots of procedures and lots of processes. And innovation is, by its nature, a somewhat unpredictable adventure that starts with taking a risk and dreaming a dream. The other thing that I think is useful to remember is that Entrepreneurship is a profoundly human desire. Entrepreneurship is about wanting to build something, wanting to create something new, wanting to make a difference um, for yourself and for your family. I also serve as chairman of Opportunity International, the largest microfinance organization in the world. We've lent $6 billion, $150 at a time. And what people do with that small amount of seed capital is become entrepreneurs in destitute and desperate circumstances. 93% of our clients are women. So this combination of innovation and entrepreneurship, and they're inextricably linked, is, and always has been, the source of problem solving and job creation and improving standards of living in this country. And what we see today, the disturbing statistics, are that more small businesses are failing and fewer are starting. For the first time, we are in the business now of destroying more businesses than we are creating. The data is very clear. 
That's and that, big, well, that worries you? It worries me tremendously because, you know, I started out as a secretary in a nine-person firm. It's where most people start, mm -hmm. in little businesses. Little businesses employ half the people in this country and create two-thirds of the new jobs. And so the source of our recommendations come from an understanding of the impact of this problem of small business destruction or lack of small business creation, a crushing of the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit in this country, and it comes about because innovators, entrepreneurs, small businesses on Main Street, they lack access to capital. They are crushed by a regulatory burden and a very complicated tax code. They don't have the kind of support and leverage that these great innovators have gotten here at Halcyon. So all of these problems are soluble. Thank you. All these problems are soluble, and some of our great co-commissioners uh, co like Ross are doing things to solve them. But if we want the middle class to grow, if we want our economy to perform at its full potential, if we want, in particular, to create more jobs and solve more problems and lift more people up, we have to unleash, once again, the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit of this country, spirit that's been so wonderfully illustrated by the innovators who presented to us today. Before I jump to Steve, do you, do you sense that it, when you meet with policymakers in Washington, D.C., you live on the West Coast, the West Coast is unbelievable when you go out and you sort of see the innovative spirit there, the ecosystem that, that, that people are, are, are drawn to to be part of that. But do you get the sense when you talk to policymakers here and you now have this Miller Center report uh, from the, with the Milstein Commission uh, that there is a recognition that something isn't working like it used to be? My sense is that when we talk about entrepreneurship, we tend to talk about the feel-good stories. We tend to think, isn't this a great wonderful dynamic that's but people don't tend to think about the mathematical equation that gets us into that into that culture and I'm wondering whether you sense that people get that well I think there's some hopeful signs and I think there's some discouraging signs um, first one of the things that we all as commissioners were very focused on is to make sure that the Main Street entrepreneur who opens a dry cleaner in a small community in America is as celebrated as Mark Zuckerberg. Mm, right. Because in fact, the torner, corner taqueria, the dry cleaner, the small innovator is as impactful in the economy as those celebrated tech entrepreneurs. Secondly, mm. if you look at the technology industry, what you'll see is it's the least regulated industry in the world. It's the most hyper-competitive industry in the world, and yet it's also one of the few industries that predictably, reliably, year after year, produces greater value at lower price every year. And that's not a coincidence. If you look at Silicon Valley, what you'll see is plenty of access to capital for good ideas, plenty of encouragement of the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit. Those are the heroes. You don't find that in every community. The hopeful sign is there's a lot of conversation about small business ownership in Washington now. There's a lot of encouragement of entrepreneurship, bipartisan encouragement of entrepreneurship. I think the discouraging sign to me is that, honestly, big government works really well for big business. And this is a town of very big government. So what big government tends to do is make things more and more complicated. And big business can deal with all that complexity. You can hire more accountants and more lawyers and more lobbyists. but. The small entrepreneur, the small innovator, the Main Street dry cleaner, they can't deal with it. And so I'm not quite sure we understand mm. that to really rev up the engine of innovation and entrepreneurship mm. in this country, we are going to have to fundamentally reform and cut away at the complexity and the size of government that is weighing on those people and their spirit. Steve, before you jump in, I want to, that, that's great. Um, you know, it, some of you may know the old story of Johnny Appleseed. Steve Case is the Johnny Appleseed of entrepreneurship when you think, he comes in a big blue bus called the Rise of the Rest bus. Uh, and, and we went around uh, recently to five cities. They had previously done four other cities. There are other cities 
outside the sort of northeast corridor or the west coast of the United States, where Steve is saying something that, you know, is said very clearly in this report, entrepreneurship can happen in every garage, it can happen in every street corner, every school lab uh, around the nation, and that the monopoly or the perception of monopoly, monopoly in these other places just isn't the case. And I just want to pay, you know, uh, homage to the fact that you've played such an important role of taking that message out there and reminding other parts of the United States and, and really globally that that ecosystem, the equation for success isn't something that Silicon Valley just has a lock on. But with that, because I know how committed you are to Rise of the Rest, what do these um, five fundamental building blocks of a better economy do you, help you achieve that goal of smoothing out entrepreneurship yeah, I think, in America? I think they help uh, leveling the playing field, both yeah. in terms of leveling the playing field for giving people more pathways who want to be entrepreneurs, giving them more encouragement, give them more education, giving them more resources, including you know, capital, uh, and also giving people you know, opportunities where, mm -hmm. where they can join companies which are creating lots of jobs. I think, I think as you just referenced, Silicon Valley is awesome. I'm, I'm proud of Silicon Valley. It continues to be the, the envy of the world. I was just in England last week, and you know, what about the Silicon Valley, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it will continue to be great. Uh, but the story of American entrepreneurship is not just about Silicon Valley, and as Carly said, it's not just about technology, it's about entrepreneurs all across the country, across all sectors of, of our economy. I think what we've done, uh, you know, there's a lot of things happening that are positive, and a lot of great companies are being created that are you know, doing really innovative things, but we need to kind of level that playing field. And it's a reminder in terms of the core question, you know, can startups save the American dream? Yes, I believe they can because they actually helped create the American dream. It's worth remembering that 250 years ago, America itself was just a startup. It, it was just an idea. And now we're the leader of the world because we have a leading economy. And the reason we have the leading economy is because entrepreneurs, first in the agricultural revolution, then industrial revolution, more recently the digital technology revolution, innovated, led the way, and America uh, led the way. That's what led us, we are, we are a startup nation. That's what, what, what made America so, so great. And we should celebrate that and recognize that it is Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and others in the technology world, that's awesome. But it's also people like Kevin Plank, who had started really in the Georgetown area, who had the idea of a better t-shirt and created Under Armour, which has created thousands of jobs, including many in Baltimore where they're based, or Sweet Green, which started a block from here by Georgetown uh, students, uh, want, wanted to provide healthier food options. Now, we've created over 1,000 jobs. Or Revolution Foods, which was a company started in Oakland by two moms who said it's not good for kids who want to go to school to have food that's not particularly healthy, and they wanted to have healthier school lunches, or Hamdi Ulakaya, an immigrant entrepreneur who took over yeah. a failed factory in upstate New York and built Chobani, yeah. one, one of the fastest growing you know, kind of you know, you know, food brands. These are, the, these are the stories of American entrepreneurs too, and what unites all the ones I just mentioned, in the last five years they've all not just created value for themselves and their investors, which is important, but they've all created lots of jobs, each mm. of, in each case over a thousand jobs in the last five years, so and that's good middle class jobs. Yesterday I was in Detroit and visiting a company, Shinola, that's trying to bring manufacturing back to Detroit. Uh, and what they're doing around watches and leather and other things, they're, they're creating is artisan craftsman culture. And the skill set watching people you know, assemble these watches, it's, it's a very high skilled mm -hmm. uh, you know, job which, which, which requires you know, a lot of training and apprenticeships. And suddenly it just started up two, three years ago. They've already created hundreds of jobs, they'll create thousands of jobs and help bring manufacturing back. Those entrepreneurs, the people who do Shinola or Sweet Green or Revolution Foods or, or Under Armour or, or, or Trouble Bonnie also need to be uh, celebrated, and we need to do a better job of leveling the playing field. So if one of those people happens to be in Louisville or St. Louis or, or Minneapolis or Detroit or other places, they too can get access to the capital. Right now, the startling statistic this past year was 76% of investment capital, venture capital, went to three states, California, Massachusetts, and New York, 76%. The other, you know, 24 percent went to the other 47 states, and the reality, if you look at the, pub, the Fortune 500 companies, our greatest companies, 76 percent of them are in those other 47 states. So we have this in, in historical imbalance, and over time, more capital will flow into these entrepreneurs all over the country. The rise of the rest, creating more jobs and more hope and more opportunity in those in those communities, and that's part of what we're trying to to say, or again, being bullish on Silicon Valley, proud of Silicon Valley, 
but recognizing the story is broader than one place or three places, and also broader than just uh, uh, technology. There are many sectors of our economy uh, that really are important, will continue to be important. That's where entrepreneurs need to focus if we're going to save the American before, dream. Before I jump to uh, Ross, Brian, and, and Lenny, and Ross and Brian, I would love to get into the money side of this in a minute, because both of you are, are deep in that. Um, I want to ask Steve, one of the, you, you, there, there's this chart in the book that's out there. You all have copies of the Milstein Symposium uh, and, and Miller Center report can start up Save the American Dream. For those of you online, this is downloadable from the website, for those of you who are watching live online. And there are five um, big, big proposals here, but one of them looks completely intriguing that I, I haven't heard about. Equip civic leaders to build entrepreneurial ecosystems. And you have uh, recommended a plug and play ecosystem in a box concept, which, which I would love to hear more about. Um, but I also know that you tend to quote an African proverb. Uh, and we're in Halcyon. We just heard these great uh, uh, proposals from uh, uh, social entrepreneurs and business entrepreneurs here. But, but there's something about clustering talent in, in areas that isn't always you know, friendly. You can have a pretty toxic environment, but bringing people who are thinking hard about how to jump up the next rung, how to solve problems, putting them, to, them together, giving them some outline of support. Is that ecosystem in a box? And that gets back to your traveling together thing that you always yeah. love to talk about. Yeah, the, the, the proverb is yeah, yeah. referencing. Tell them the if proverb. you want to go quickly, you can go alone. But if you want to go far, you must go together. It requires teamwork. Entrepreneurship is a team yeah. sport. And building strong startup communities requires a collective effort of people in the, in the, in the community. There is a role for the large businesses in, but in any, the But every one of these cities we went to in Rise of the Rest, that, that, that notion of clustering of people working together was just so palpably obvious that if any one of them had been working alone, it would not have worked. I mean, and, was, and the key, I mean, some, yeah. some of the work we did you know, Four years ago now with the Startup America partnership, which continues up global and startup weekends and initial like that and rosting a lot. You can talk about with, uh, with, with, with Village Capital on this. It's how do you get people in each of these communities to recognize that startups really are the seed corn that is going to create the innovation, which is going to create the jobs and drive the growth in the future. You've got mm -hmm. to keep reinvesting. The Fortune 500 turns over over half of it every 25 years or so. And that's because you know, we, we've done a pretty good job on this innovation engine to try to put new disruptions in place. So we have led the way in some of these new areas. That's true for countries. It's also true for communities. And you know, take Detroit as an example, as I mentioned just here yesterday. It's worth remembering that 60 years ago, 70 years ago maybe, Detroit was Silicon Valley. Detroit was the hottest entrepreneurial city in the world when the automobile was the hot technology of the time on fire. Supply chain, thousands of companies, millions of jobs. Detroit lost its way because we saw the globalization of, of essentially the car business, and there's a lot of reasons why it lost its way, which you know, I think you know, we can go into, but I don't think it's as interesting. It's fighting its way back by investing, trying to stabilize the car industry, but also investing in startups. What's happening in the downtown Detroit area gives me hope that Detroit will come, come back. It's also worth remembering that 100 years ago, 125 years ago, Pittsburgh was Silicon Valley. Right. This Pittsburgh was the steel capital powering the whole Industrial Revolution. So these cities that are great American cities, their history, if you kind of dig into them, has to do with what entrepreneurs did, pioneering not just companies, but entire industries in different places around the, you know, the, the, uh, the country. We he need to understand that story and make sure each community recognizes its particular unique skill set. And each community has So what is this ecosystem in a box? It's how do, you, how do you take all the learning from all the country, indeed all over the world, and, and make it easy for people to understand the best practices. So whether you're the mayor or the CEO of a company or entrepreneur or a nonprofit, you can understand what it takes. And a lot of it is just connecting the dots, creating more of this teamwork, more of this collaboration, creating more network density. And each, mm -hmm. each city, as you know, from has a little bit different dynamic in terms of different aspects that are driving. There's not like a kind of a one-size-fits-all solution here, but it requires making it Some clear Some places are all about food delivery. Some places are about health care. Yeah, right? the, if you, you look know, at it like a Nashville, it health, it's, it's known as a yeah. music capital, and it is a music capital, yeah. but health care, a lot of health care innovation is happening there because a lot of health companies. Right. Louisville, there's a lot of ag tech, agricultural technology happening because of their, their, it's a farming you know, country with a lot of great companies. St. Louis, biotechnology, and, and also a lot of things in this 
in ag tech uh, areas. Pittsburgh's really good at making stuff. Robotic technology, particularly because of Carnegie Mellon, because Pittsburgh's one of the leaders in the, in the world in robotics technology. So each area has a sort of a unique, you know, kind of differentiation, a unique skill set that they need to build on, but they really need to recognize if they're kind of resting on their laurels, and this because they have P&G in Cincinnati or U.S. Steel in Pittsburgh or what have you, it's like, well, that's fine, but you gotta keep reinventing your community by supporting and investing in startups in a collaborative way. Ross Bryant, if, if, if I can just mean, I know, you have a two finger, Carly? I, I just wanted to, to add to this because I think it's really important. I love that proverb. You know, again, at a profoundly human level, entrepreneurship and innovation is hard. It's hard because it's taking risks. It's mm -hmm. hard because if you take risks, you might make mistakes. It's hard because the system doesn't always necessarily support it. And so even at a most fundamental level, I talked about Opportunity International, you take a poor woman, give her $150, we never leave her alone. Mm. We surround her with what's called a trust circle, experienced entrepreneurs who can help with tools and training. And so the ecosystem in a box idea is to say, gather these entrepreneurs and innovators together so that they get the support. Make sure that they have the capital necessary. Make sure that there is a feeder pool mm -hmm. in the educational system and make sure in particular that the elected officials in that community understand how important these people are and how they need to think about their policies and their practices to support this group of people. It's so, it's so important, you know, and, and as I've looked at the microcredit arena globally, you know, one of the things that I've often thought needed to be part of the lessons taught was supporting those people who failed once and giving them another chance. Yeah. Because in many parts of the, of the world, not in the microcredit area, you're jailed if you fail. You, you have liabilities that don't give you another, uh, another opportunity like the United States. And, and that's something that I think we need to export a bit. But Brian and Ross, you know, in the, item one and item two uh, in your proposals were unlock capital for Main Street entrepreneurs and accelerate impact investing through PRIs, program-related uh, investments, much, much of which we've, we've heard here today. And I guess my question to, you, to both of you is, how do you see the money side of this? But more importantly, do, do you see, I mean, w whether it's Mark Zuckerberg we're talking about or not, we, we often only hear the good stories. Are there a lot of good stories out there that died because they didn't get the money and financing they needed that can every be picked up day. again? So tell us that story. I love, this so, brings me back to the dark side that I love to hear about. The dark side. Yeah. Uh, well, but before we jump into the dark side, I do want to say thank you for, for having me here. I was really honored to make you know, some, some modest contributions, and I just learned a ton in the process, um, you know, spending a couple of days with, with you know, our- You have an awesome our, website, by our the way. Co oh, thank you. Our co-captains and my fellow commissioners was a real honor. Um, and every day we deal with helping folks get funding from, you know, at Rocket Hub from, from their communities and from corporate folks that are participating on our website as well. And I would say without question at every single stage in a startup's life, it's the number one pain point. In the early days, it's okay, I wanna get my 50 to 100K and kinda of get my concept mm -hmm. built, get my minimal vi viable product out there. Then once you get that going, then it's okay, I need to scale up, I need to hit that you know, half million to a million you know, seed or, or, or mini A stage. And from every point on, it becomes kinda of this never ending um, uh, feed the fire for, for most entrepreneurs. They're always kind of having one foot in the fundraising realm. And what was really interesting is, you know, by, by, by spending time, um, you know, with the commissioners, we, we were able to look at that there really isn't a silver bullet um, to solving this, solving the problem, the, the, the capital crisis problem. It is very much a, a holistic approach and there are different tools and methodologies needed. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, that really serving, you know, the, 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 uh, the early startups and the, and the Main Street entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. that they had kind of a, a place that they could, that they could go that was um, educational, that wasn't in legalese or bankerese, that, ha that was resourceful um, and that was, you know, accessible um, with, you know, uh, money, most of the money in, uh, from VCs going to three states that leaves the rest of the states almost a, in, a, in a capital desert. And we need to put some outposts there and some tools and some, and some educational components so that those entrepreneurs kind of know where to go and know how to get through some of those uh, pieces of the desert. Yeah, I'm gonna start by pandering to your dark side and Good. say that um, I, think, I think in entrepreneurship, it's better to be specific even if you're wrong than vague uh, and right. And I think we've laid out a few specific solutions to a very specific problem. And uh, to 
echo what Steve said, it's that most entrepreneurs in the US, if you're not building something that will create 12 jobs and get acquired by Facebook in two years, uh, you're not really a candidate for funding for venture capital. And we, my firm, we work in Salt Lake City and Houston and Louisville and, and all across the country. And we see, we work with people like you and you and your peers say, venture funds don't really care about us because we're solving important problems and we don't live in their backyard. And I think that um, the good news is, and we've highlighted in this report, there are huge, huge pools of capital that already exist. We don't need to get people to put in new money uh, that can go into startups in Salt Lake or in Washington, D.C. And um, so we've highlighted three things. Uh, one is Community Reinvestment Act dollars. Raise your hand if you know what the Community Reinvestment Act is. Say probably two thirds of the room. So it's banks are required to invest dollars they have uh, in underserved communities and the federal legislation is pretty unclear. There are some banks, um, and there was one fund that we talked about in Salt Lake City, Utah, that we work a lot with that had uh, community reinvestment at banks have pooled and created a $20 million startup fund that is invested in startups that have created thousands of jobs and gone public out of Salt Lake City. Um, program related investments. How many of you have heard of a program related investment? It is an investment that a foundation can make in a company that has a relationship to the mission of the foundation. And foundations everywhere can invest in startups out of the grant dollars that they're already making. And fewer than 1% of foundations invest, uh, make, make program related investments. And then donor advised funds. How many of you heard of donor advised funds? There are twice as many dollars in donor advised funds in the US, which are charitable pools that can, again, invest in startups as there are under management by venture capital funds. And we, Village Capital, we've invested in 40 startups across the country over the last five years in the middle of the country. Uh, a huge part of, we, we have a fund, it's about $10 million. A lot of it is program related investment, donor advised fund. These companies have raised, they've raised $100 million, most of it from commercial mainstream capital. They've created 7,000 jobs, and these, are, and these are middle of the country companies that got their start from uses of capital that you could use tomorrow if, if you're at a bank or have a foundation. Let me, let me ask you a tough question. So, I mean, that all, community reinvestment, um, I've known for years, and, and, and it's had, you know, frankly, a spotty record uh, mixed results over time. So the money, the pool, the methodology is there. But how do you get places like this that are not traditionally engaged in sort of reward seek I mean I believe in greed uh, okay, yeah. no, I'm, I'm just kidding but but the greed dimension of it is there and what you're saying is here are these other sides so Judith Roden at Rockefeller has written about social impact investing and a lot of that is going on there and I think it makes sense you can look at rewards uh, that come back from smart investing structured the right way but how do you get non-traditional investors to do the kind of of of, of, of financial investment and, and get the right incentives in place so that they're uh, governance allows them to take the kind of risk that Steve Case's company Revolution takes when it invests in Sweet Green. You were not out there just trying to, I mean, maybe you were trying to be nice, but I get the sense that you wanted to get a return uh, on, on your investment in Sweet Green and, and some of the other kinds of things. So, people and ideas but, but, that can change but the world. We do want a yeah, financial yeah, return and we yeah. do want a, 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 an impact. And the Case Foundation actually has the same mission. We invest in people and ideas that can change the world. So sometimes we believe it's best. What gets a better return, Case of, Foundation or Revolution? Well, Gene, my wife runs it, yeah, it talks about this because we've been pushing uh, impact investing you know, pretty hard. But when you're when your foundation making a grant, you're mm. guaranteed that you're going to lose 100% of your capital. Right. And you're pretty much guaranteed they'll come back and ask. When you're making a venture investment, you are hopeful that you will return your capital and maybe get three times back or five times back, or if you're lucky, ten times back. So it is different. Now, we think there is a middle ground between losing 100% of your capital and only investing if you think you're going to get 500% back. Well, no, is this is a very tweetable comment right here. This is a very, yeah. Um, interesting. So in, in that, but how do you get, how, when, you, when you're looking, because I think it's an important proposal you're making. But it's got to come along with a guidebook to these institutions on how they get their governance and incentives in place that, that they feel that this is the right kind of expedition to go on. Sure. So, for example, and I think this picks up on a comment that Carly made earlier that we think is a really important recommendation on the commission. We, we in our companies, uh, you know, for our fund or for our company's fundraising rounds, talk to foundations and talk to banks all the time about this 
more potentially risk tolerant pool of capital for startups. And 99% of the time they'd say, well, that sounds great. I'll, let's have our general counsel look at it. And the general counsel says, it's unclear. We don't know whether we can do it. So the default answer is no. So the, I mean, the results are there. There are great startups that can deliver financial returns already. And, and we can talk about a thousand of them. I think that the problem is people don't have the risk tolerance to use these pool of capital because uh, particularly whether it's Treasury or whether it's Congress, but a lot of this could be done within the Department of Treasury without legislation. Um, more clear regulations around program-related investments, around community reinvestment at credit uh, would, we think, and we know from talking to a lot of these asset holders, make them more likely to invest in startups if they knew what the federal regulations were. So it's a lot of what both Steve and Carly said around regulation and clarity is important. Lenny, just some, let me highlight the three other uh, here. Build a regulatory roadmap, empower the next generation of entrepreneurial leaders, and equip civic leaders to build these entrepreneurial ecosystems. And I know you've thought deeply about all of these, particularly in California, but when you're, when you're going to move the needle on the environment and sort of make it a healthier, more robust, uh, sort of pro-entrepreneurship, pro-startup America, um, why, what, which of these three do you think need to be, need to be pushed in? How, how do you go talk to somebody about actualizing this? So, um, first of all, as, as we talked about earlier, it isn't one, it's not a silver bullet. So the answer is you have to have all those things in place. You have to have the capital, you have to have a regulatory environment that's supported, you have to have the right leadership, and you have to have the ecosystem to surround it. So you can't pick one and say, just do that one. So but let's say, let's say, let's go to Detroit. So Steve Bach of, of, uh, um, Shinola was with us in Rise of the Rest. He's, he's this, the, the president of, of Shinola and moving over there, and Detroit is in this. Are there things that could you thought about taking these dimensions sort of to a city? And let's say, let's focus on, you know, Steve wants to focus on every city in the country, but let's just pick one. How would sure. you move the needle with Detroit? So I'll, I'll give you an example that will not be intuitive that I think could be replicated. So. Um, one of the most successful funds that happened in, started in the worst time in the venture capital cycle was a fund called DBL, Double Bottom Line. It was started by the Bayer Council, which is a group of business leaders, right. and its mission was to invest in neighborhoods in the Bay Area that were underprivileged. So even in the richest part of the country, there is Hunter's Point, there is Richmond, there's West Oakland, there's Pescadero, and those areas are all designated CRA investment zones. So what the fund did was to create a fund, got its capital largely from banks that got CRA investment credit mm. for it, invested in businesses that were in those neighborhoods and met social objectives. The net result of that was top 5% venture capital returns, mm. job creation in the tens of thousands, including being in the early rounds and starting companies, some of which you've heard of like Tesla, Solar City, but also Revolution Foods and Pandora. So, you know, this is possible. It's about how do you look at it from what you're trying to accomplish, which is create new ventures that are interesting. I can't wait to see the impact investing bubble story happen 10 years from now. It will be fantastic if there's too much capital going into what we're talking about. I, I think, you know, um, Lenny said something very important and the commission struggled with this because we started out with actually a far larger number of recommendations mm. and we wanted to boil it down to the essential few but the essential few are five meaning mm. you can't just pick one <laughs> right. uh, there does need to be an ecosystem there does need to be a regulatory roadmap there does need to be access to capital there does need to be a celebration and education of the entrepreneurial uh, mindset and spirit and the right tools. All those things together we think are important and there is much proof in many places that it works. The regulatory roadmap is important because it's not just a question of clarity, although we have lack of clarity in a lot of these um, rules, it's a oversaturation of the rules as well. And so we put that recommendation in because we think that transparency is the first step to problem solving and accountability. And we said if people could actually see as they're focused on trying to revitalize a Detroit or they're focused on trying to build businesses in Pescadero, 
a traditional, lovely California fishing village, if they could actually see through the eyes of an entrepreneur all of the stuff that they have to deal with, mm. perhaps people would begin to take the first step and say, we got to clear some of this away. Because if you're a little guy or gal starting up, you don't know how to get through all that. I think it's also worth pointing out that there are some things that we agreed were important but didn't put in the report because we wanted a report that basically was things that we collectively could rally around getting done that doesn't really rely on legislation, for example. There are things that need to still be done. You know, this week, a new startup act is being introduced in the Senate, which will cover a number of different things, including more access to capital, some issues around immigration. Today, there was another high-skilled immigration uh, bill uh, issue. We need to solve some of these big problems around regulations, around capital, around you know, talent, which is uh, immigration. I know is viewed this town as sort of a, a problem we need to solve. I think it's an opportunity we need to seize if we're going to continue to remain the, the magnet for talent, continue to be the most innovative entrepreneur nation. So, but those are things that do require legislation to really deal with them once and for all. This report was designed to supplement that. Uh, so an example on, on, the, on the issue of access to capital, actually the Congress did come together two and a half years ago and passed the Jump Starting Our Business Startups Act, sometimes mm -hmm. called the Jobs Act. Did a number of things. One was creating an on-ramp for IPOs for what they called the emerging growth companies. Last year there were more IPOs than we've seen in a decade. And it wasn't entirely because of the Jobs Act, but it was partially because of the Jobs Act because it created that kind of on-ramp. If that hadn't been done by Congress, that there would be fewer companies able to access the public markets right now to, to get the growth capital they needed. It also legalized crowdfunding. There are now crowdfunding, uh, many crowdfunding services that you can use to generate project crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. you know, and and you know, we, we talked about uh, some of that. And there's one particular product, uh, I think it was on Kickstarter, that raised over $10 million for its product, which by the way is called the Coolest Cooler. And it basically is a really innovative cooler. I think somebody decided what's what's like the ideal cooler. Now they're like take to a picnic and came up with all these ideas, created a fascinating video, and, and raised thirteen million dollars before they even had the money to make one. That's only possible because of innovation right. such as, as as crowdfunding. But right now you can use that really only raise... possible because of what you did with AOL many many years well, ago. Mm -hmm. but, it, it, uh... it's only possible basically to, if you have a product that you can essentially ask people to pre-buy. That that works you know, pretty well now. But using crowdfunding so you could raise capital for your company, investment capital, either equity or debt capital, the Congress passed that law two and a half years ago. It is legal. The SEC still has not finalized the rules to allow people to do it. And that's a big problem in these rise of the rest areas. Well, that's what you, you know, when you go to you know, San Francisco and, or New York or, or Boston, you talk, well, crowdfunding is really important because you know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't have access to capital. They look at you kind of puzzled. Because there is a lot of capital in, in San Francisco, and you, you go to you know there's maybe too much capital in San Francisco. But if you go to Detroit or Cincinnati or Louisville, there's a real dearth of capital, and you need to make sure all entrepreneurs, wherever they are, whatever idea they're trying to pursue, have a shot. Now many will fail, as you mm. mentioned, but at least give them a shot. Right. Uh, and that's where this, you know, this innovation around capital is is important. So I've not seen the long form um, of the of this new report yet, but. I remember when Bob Lighton and the Kaufman Foundation released their report on what to do to, to, to jumpstart startups in America, and that led to the Startup Act. And the Startup Act was wonderful because it really went through in, in sort of uh, very specific detail a roster of legislative steps that were needed uh, for this town to focus on. Some of that got done, some of it didn't, and I assume that the Startup Act you just referred to is sort of the Yeah, some of the know, same the, people the that, uh, right. so that deals Moran, with immigration you know, Warner and, and others all that, right. reintroducing it to kind of update it to deal with some of the other unfinished business. So it raises the question, you know, we're in Washington, D.C. right now. We, maybe we could be doing this in Salina, Kansas, or, or, or wherever we may be in the country, but, I mean, how much do you need this town to help further the goals and initiatives that you've sort of laid out as the, the five key pillars. So is a community reinvestment funding something that uh, is decided nationally, or is that something you've got to go state by state? And I think the other part of this question I, I want to ask Carly and, and, and maybe Lenny is, it seems to me, you know, and knowing that the Solar City folks or Elon Musk or others, that in any of these new businesses that come on and get scale and begin to spread, they run into dissimilar regulatory environments as they spread across the country. And I've always wondered why there isn't sort of a Darwinian thing that kicks in, that you're going to see growth and gains in the places that have the best regulatory environment and those that don't just fall behind. And why isn't that gravity 
enough to make this work? What, what is it with regulation that is resilient against sort of common sense economic growth? <laughs> So first, let me just reiterate something that Steve said. We, we purposefully put into this report recommendations that don't need government. I see. Although government has much it needs to do. And uh, by government, I mean whether it's a regulatory agency like the SEC that needs to get on with it or whether it's Congress. But I think the answer to the question you asked is we tend to think in Washington that it's all about doing something more. And I think what we also need to include is undoing a lot. The regulatory roadmap recommendation is to try and focus people on all the stuff that has been built up over decades. I mean, when was the last time we actually did an inventory of all the regulations that are on the books? Answer. Not in my lifetime, not in anybody's lifetime. So the point is, the analogy I use, it's like geologic sediment. I mean, we have, you know, eons, millennia of rules and regulations at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. And it has become a primordial soup. And if you're a big company, you can handle it. But if you're a startup and a small company, you really can't. And so I know I'm jumbling my analogies there, primordial soup and you know, prehistoric ooze, but you get the point. The, it's the back point to darkness the, and the, cynicism. The point, exactly. <laughs> the, the point is we have to start undoing some of this stuff as well. And I think we have to undo it with the point of view of entrepreneurs and small businesses and innovators mm. in mind. And so one of our purposes in recommending a regulatory roadmap is first to take advantage of technology that exists today. It's not that hard to get an entire regulatory roadmap out there on the web. There are people who, I mean, I'd love to meet these people, but they spend their weekends you know, cataloging all these rules and sticking them out there. But I think if we would get a look at, a real clear-eyed look at all the stuff that's on the books, we would understand why we are crushing the entrepreneurial spirit of this nation. So yes, we have to do some things, but fundamentally we have to start undoing some things. And I think that requires quite a different mindset here in Washington and fundamental reform. So the, Don, just to build on the regulation point, uh, you know, all the regulation, probably most of the regulations were put in place for a good reason at the time. Yeah. Normally something bad was happening that didn't want to happen again or trying to protect people and, you know, in a legitimate kind of way. And that intent is, 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 uh, was obviously uh, appropriate. But some of those regulations, Carly said, may not be appropriate today in a new world where technology is more ubiquitous. I was told that, I don't know for sure, but you have to fill out like 60 forms. You want to open a restaurant here in Washington, D.C., which seems like a lot. And now, it is now, a be, lot. now because of the help and other things, there are ways to have the, essentially the quality control and food quality, other kind of things basically done in a way that probably means not all those are needed anymore. So how do you take a fresh look at that? And how do you also make sure regulations that were put in place for the right reason aren't unintentionally protecting the incumbent versus enabling disruptors? And there's gonna be a growing tension around that, that issue. So there should be regulations that legitimately protect people and legitimately you know, are kind of lay the ground rules, if you will, for that particular uh, sector, but there was a lot that was put in place at one point before there was an internet, before there was technology, or are still in place because people kind of like them in being placed because they kind of like the status quo. And the whole battle around uh, innovation and entrepreneurship is a battle between essentially attackers and defenders. The attackers are the entrepreneurs trying to challenge the status quo, usher in a better way, better product, better service, lower price, what something. Uh, the, the defenders are the existing companies that kind of like the way it is and are trying to kind of protect the status quo. That's always going to be the battle. Our nation has actually done a better job than other you know, nations around driving this disruption. And you can see that in the turnover of, of the Fortune 500 is far greater than like the 5100 in, in, in London. I mean, the companies there, big companies there 25 years ago, I think only 20% turnover versus over 50% here. How do we continue to make sure that disruption happens? It's scary and the big companies don't like it and even a lot of people work for the big companies don't like it either uh, so there's always going to be some tension but unless you are planting that seed corn around the next wave around the innovation around kind of where the puck's going 
somebody else is, and it may not just be in some other city, it increasingly is some other country, because we're now seeing the globalization of entrepreneurship. So we really need to say, a lot of good things are happening, we're still the most entrepreneurial nation in the world, but there's lots of reasons to be anxious about the future, and unless we get the regulatory environment right, unless we support entrepreneurs all over the country, not just in a, in a, in a, in a few places, we will wake up, you know, potentially 25 years from now, 50 years from now, and say, oh, how do we lose our, our lead as the most entrepreneurial nation? It's ours to lose, but we can lose it unless we really take this pretty seriously. Ross, Brian, uh, Lenny, let me ask you, you guys a question, then I want to go to the audience. But um, Aaron Levy, who's the CEO of Bach, had an interesting tweet the other day that's been on my mind. He said, you know, all the companies in America that were, were built and made in the 50s and 60s and 70s, that all the startups today are essentially digitizing those companies. And it made me think, if that's in fact true, where are we on that transition? And, and once we finish that transition, we're growing our lettuce locally, we've got our motion sickness, uh, um, you know, sound outs and things like this. Is, is, there a, is, is there a slowdown? Is this one of those great transitions that happens with a big surge? Uh, and then, calm, or is that a naive question? Ross? I mean, I think that to an initial point that Carly made, entrepreneurship is problem solving. And I think mm -hmm. that where we see innovation continuing to happen, and I guess in your, the transition not slowing down, is when communities are figuring out what they are really good at. So it is a terrific place uh, to be an agriculture technology startup here in Louisville, Kentucky, or a health startup if you're in Salt Lake City. And the startups we're seeing now are figuring out that tiny subset of a problem that the startups five years ago didn't solve and solving that. So you're actually, I think, seeing accelerated innovation when you have groups of entrepreneurs, investors, collaborating and providing the fuel to each other to, con to continue pushing. So I would say um, if you've got a lettuce startup in all 50 states, you're not going to move 100 times as quick as if you've got 50 lettuce startups in Louisville or St. Louis or wherever you pick. So I think where, where are the lettuce guys, by the way? Yeah, you, you're both here. So did, did you guys read Walter Isaacson's book, The Innovators? You did read that? So, so the, really, the bottom line to Walter Isaacson's book is all of the great geniuses we, we, we know out there and think out there were really pairs of geniuses, that there was someone known and maybe someone unknown, but that, that this notion of unique uh, independent genius is probably a fallacy that people that, that they work together. So I just wanted to say pay credit because you were two guys who came up and did that. So you have much greater chance of success than all of the, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that the, the big thing that we, to your other question of how much do startups need Washington, I think through sheer force of will, entrepreneurs are going to be successful regardless of what Most startups Washington I know does. hate Washington. Um, and a no. lot of what we have in this report are actionable suggestions for anybody anywhere. So for example, um, I feel out of my pay grade talking about the Community Reinvestment Act with the uh, president of a bank generously bringing us together, but there are leaders in banks who have decided to use Community Reinvestment Act credit to invest in funds like DBL. You, if you're involved with the foundation, could decide to channel resources to startups in your community. So I, I guess the best Communities like Detroit and manufacturing in Louisville and agriculture have bunches of leaders who know what that community is about. And when you have that kind of focus at a community level, you don't see innovation slow down. Ryan? We're also seeing things at a generational level. The millennials are really big about changing things for the better. Um, and I think that that generational mindset, it almost reminds me of a similar mindset that my grandparents had when they were kind of, you know, the, the build, building the nation up, uh, you know, uh, uh, World War I, World War II. Um, and I think that, that there is um, this generational lens and folks coming out of schools and saying, instead of, you know, taking a job at a, at a big, safe company, um, I want to do my own thing. And I have this idea that I'm passionate about, whether it's lettuce or something else. And, I, and, and basically, you're, you're telling the rest of the world, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're kind of telling the rest of the world that, hey, I know something you don't know, and I'm going to bring this thing to, to, to light. And I think that a lot of millennials... Um, yeah. Are there enough of them there? Because one of the things this report says is that there is a stigma and bias against encouraging people in K-12 through programs to become entrepreneurs, that it's too risky. So I just want to basically call you out on that because... What you're saying in the report is 
we need to do more to inspire, to embed. Millennials are already out of school now, right? The millennials are out of school. I think they could help us with this report, getting folks that are either either even younger than them out there and in, in, um, you know involved in entrepreneurship. But you asked the question of, do I think right now we're in a phase of entrepreneurial growth? And I would say yes, that there that we could be, um, and the millennial uh, lens would would help that. I, I think though, to your point. Um, First of all, virtually everyone on this commission, and certainly the great innovators we heard from today, there's a little bit of self-selection that goes on. But if you look at the broad data, there's clearly a problem. Mm. If you look at the broad data, we have historically high youth unemployment rates. If you look at the broad data, we don't have enough encouragement and education around entrepreneurialism. If you look at the broad data, we have more small businesses failing and fewer starting. If you look at the broad data, Mm. There are fewer startups than there have been and more businesses being destroyed than being created. So we can't ignore the big picture. And um, I'm reminded of something on this point that um, several entrepreneurs said to me a couple years ago. I was chairing a panel at the Clinton Global Initiative. Two years ago, their focus was on entrepreneurship. And it was this wonderful panel with these three, they all happened to be young women, And uh, they all had started really um, interesting uh, small businesses. One was in, uh, one was a bakery, one was kind of a manufacturing incubator. In any event, um, one of them made the point and the others agreed. They said, you know, we are training kids today in school to be employees, not entrepreneurs. There's nothing wrong with being an employee, but there is something very right about understanding how exciting and fun and how rewarding it can be to be an entrepreneur. And that's what we're trying to point well, out think, in the report. I think report. this talent issue, I mean, capital is really important. We talked about this. Talent mm-hmm. is really important, too. I do think we need to do a better job in K-12 of inspiring. I think people start at, in kindergarten relatively creative, and by the time they graduate, we've drummed a lot out of them, and kind of they're more thinking in the box. And entrepreneurs than anything else is kind of thinking out of the box and thinking about problems to solve problems. or opportunities to seize in a, in a different light. So I think that's number one. Number two, to your point about Walter Isaacson's book, I half agree with your summary of it. You know, it's partly around partnerships. You're but the, featured heavily the, the in that broader, The broader, <laughs> the broader, I agree with that part. The broader, <laughs> the broader theme is not about just having co-founders, although that, that can be very important. It's about how communities mm. collectively right. innovate and how innovation builds on innovation. So right. even the internet right. started with government, with ARPA, and you know, a bunch of companies doing things, other companies did things. Hundreds of companies, right. tens of thousands of people helped make that part of everyday life. And it's how you, in each of these communities, focus on some things where you can have that kind of iteration and evolution that, that really allows you to, to see some of these big opportunities. The final one you mentioned, and, it, and it, it's, a, it's an interesting, I hear it a lot, which is that entrepreneurs hate government. That is mostly true, because they are trying to think out of the box and they feel like government's trying to train them. But my view is the next wave of entrepreneurs are going to require a different skill set than the last wave, right? particularly of the internet. I see the first wave, which I was obviously part of, just building the internet, making it, understand, people understand what it was, and connecting, creating networks and software and all that kind of stuff. That was sort of 1985 to 2000 or so. And that was AOL and Yahoo and Cisco, a lot of companies did that. The last 15 years is kind of because the internet's already been built, building on top of the internet. Mm. And that's sort of this app economy, that's Facebook and Twitter, and, and you know, because it, it, you could presume everybody was connected, the focus was on essentially this app. It became a hit business. You knew pretty mm. quickly whether it was successful or not. The third wave is going to be a much more challenging, but ultimately, I think, more gratifying you know, kind of wave, which is because the internet's already been built and because things have already been built on top of it, now the challenge is to really integrate it seamlessly through every aspect of our lives in terms of health and education and energy and transportation and food, really important parts of our lives, really important <laughs> sectors of our economy. And that's going to require more perseverance, it's not going to be the overnight success require more partnerships. The African proverb, you aren't going to be able to go it alone. You're going to have to do it together. It's going to require engaging more with governments because many of these sectors will continue to be regulated, maybe less, maybe differently, but some. And actually, the government's a major customer a lot of those things, like health and education. So I think the, the next generation entrepreneur, and you heard some of these stories, they, is going to be a little bit different dance. This was about product. This was about people. This was about apps. This was about you know, hits. 
This is going to be much more about partnership and perseverance and, and policy, and, and it's going to require a little bit different skill set. And some of these regions around the country that we're talking about actually think are going to be uniquely well suited to do that. I will bet a lot of innovation, as, as Ross said, around agriculture is going to be in places like you know, Louisville or St. Louis, because they have a history of right. understanding those, those sectors and a history of understanding the complexity of how those supply chains work, including how the partnerships need to be formed and what like role government re reasonably should play. Great. Well, one other point uh -huh. on this, to, again to your dark side. So all the things that Steve just said are obviously true, but there's one other thing that the technology does and that is that it shortens time frames for everything, which means we have less time to get things right. The margins of error decline dramatically. And any idea, any job, money can go anywhere. Yep. So it's important to think about all this in the context of time. And I, the one place where I disagree with Steve is it's not 25 years that we're gonna wake up and say we're not number one anymore. I think it's potentially less than a decade. Not because money, ideas, talent, jobs, they can go anywhere, anytime, and the margin for error gets very small, and the time frames get very tight. Which is why that ecosystem is so important overall. That's right. That's I agree right. with you, by the yeah. way. I just didn't yeah. want to get Lenny, did you much. have a quick yeah. thought on this? <laughs> you can go to the audience. Okay. okay. Let me open up to the audience. We've got Mike Runners, I think, out here. Do we, Jeff, have Mike? Um, so we can, uh, we've got a, uh, the lady in red. I've been waiting to say that. Uh, okay. If we can go right up, uh, bring the mic right up to this person. And just tell us quickly who you are, and if you have a, a way that I can get the five miles credit for running this morning when I forgot to wear this, that would be really happy. I don't know if I can help with that. <laughs> okay. um, my name is Heather Lover Sewell. I'm a member of the first class of the Halcyon Incubator. Oh, congratulations. Um, and thank you. And I have a question that I'm sure is on the mind of all of my classmates. But first, I've been waiting over a decade to thank you, Mr. Case. My project, my venture, would not be possible if you hadn't offered AOL members free web space in the 90s. Wow. That yeah, started cool. my venture. Oh, well, thank you. So, good thank for you. you. I am here because of you. I tweeted out the other day that Jack Ma and Alibaba couldn't have done what they did without Steve Case either. <laughs> a press agent. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is probably a basic question, but it's something that has been on my mind every day that I was here. And with all the amazing people here, I want to know, for all of us in this class and this new class, what is your most profound advice for people who are just starting out like us? Hmm. Thank you. A hush falls over the panel. Um, I'll start. I, I think it was inspired by some of the, the, the things we heard this morning, which I'm sure were similar in, the, in the, you know, your, your class, uh, which is pick a battle worth fighting. Pick a big idea. There are a lot of entrepreneurs who don't, and yeah, that's fine. They just want to create another photo app. You know, maybe they'll be Snapchat or Instagram. And, but congratulations if they're successful. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But I think we have actually really big problems in the world around health and education. Some of the things I, I referenced. You know, having more entrepreneurial energy focused on that, recognizing their harder problems, recognizing it's going to take longer, recognizing it's more risky and more more risk of, of failure and so forth. But if they're successful, it's going to be far more rewarding, not just an entrepreneur you know, generating jobs or creating wealth or whatever, but the impact you can have on the world. To me, it's how do you take a, have more of a big idea, swing for the fences, change the world, built to last uh, kind of mentality. More of that, I think, would, would be what I would encourage. Um, thanks for giving me time to think. Um, so I would say three things. Um, there is no substitute for hard work, and it's really hard. I mean, what you guys are doing is hard. There is no substitute for hard work. The second thing I would say is, this may sound strange, but um, I give this advice in a lot of settings, don't sell your soul. And what I mean by that is, because it's hard, um, there are lots of opportunities to be, to be less than you are, to shoot lower. There will be lots of people who come along and say, um, you don't really want to go there or do that. 
I'll make it easier for you to back off a little bit. So don't let that happen, whatever the situation. And the third thing I would say is, um, and it's really to Steve's point, as we grow older, we realize the only thing we control in our lives is our choices. That's it. So control your choices and choose, choose what you want your life to be because you have the great opportunity to make those choices and not everybody does. Great. You know, when I, I was a co-founder of the New America Foundation and Lenny Mendoza was uh, my, on my board uh, uh, forever, but the one thing I'll put on the table is having been in a, a think tank entrepreneur, ideas entrepreneur, um, that I, I know may sound ridiculously obvious, but in our think tank competition in town, if you sort of look at, you know, their good ideas that died, why did they die? Because they didn't think about how to communicate. They didn't think that there were, there were things beyond whatever innovation you're doing it, the, you know, you can die because you don't have money and support. You can also die because you're one hand clapping and no one heard you sort of uh, attempting to do that. So I would just simply say, as you do this, think about how you're going to platform, find platforms or strategies to communicate what you're doing. I find that the, one of the biggest deficits in the social entrepreneurship space. I will also say that a lot of the, my friends that are in the sort of global justice community, which I admire, don't think in terms of playbook. They don't look at what what you know, what are the hard choices that they're going to work through? What's the playbook for them to get? There's a lot of sentiment and a lot of heart and not a lot of strategy. So I would say invest in strategy. That's something there. But again, I'm the Nixtonian uh, on, the, on the panel. Yes, in the very back. Uh, hi, uh, Ben Brody, uh, Bloomberg News. Uh, this hi. is actually, hi, uh, fellow traveler. Uh, this cool. is actually for Carly, uh, you've talked a lot about uh, some of the things that we need to do, some of the things that the government needs to do, uh, looking ahead to the future, looking to the 2016 field, those who have declared, those who haven't, uh, but are likely to, including possibly yourself, do you think that they have the right uh, answers and strategies for these uh, kinds of issues? Great question, politic. Boy, that was a graceful segue. <laughs> You know, the short answer is that's what elections are about. That's what elections are about, is for people to decide which candidates have the right answers. Um, what I hope, honestly, is that the value of this report, it's a bipartisan commission, it's a bipartisan or nonpartisan set of recommendations. I hope what this report and others like it do is raise the awareness of every candidate or every sitting politician as to why the people that they don't hear much from in Washington, the little guys, mm. actually matter right now far more than the big guys. This is a town that works for the big guys, big government, big labor, big business. It's always been that. That's a nonpartisan comment. It's always been that way. And our future very much while we celebrate our big companies, because every one of them started out as a little company at one point, our future very much depends on the little guys. And I think that requires a rethinking of what the role of government is here and in communities across the country. And I hope very much that this nonpartisan report will sensitize people to that and get them thinking about it and show them some successes. Let's make some news here. If um, you were Wilf Blitzer and you were moderating presidential debates, what question would you like applied uh, to every presidential candidate that, that, that emerges? What, what related to this report, Steve? Well, I think it'd be this question. I think building on what Carly said, I think I think there are a lot of challenges and you know a lot of issues, and, and you know the world's complicated, and you know. But can you put it in a scary. question? I, th I think the core question would be how do we remain the leader of the free world? How do we remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation? What three things would you do if you were elected president to make sure that startups can continue to save the American dream? One thing we haven't talked about related to that would be how do you get more focus on startups that don't just create wealth, but also create jobs? Because mm. part of the challenge with technology, and it's a global dynamic that will continue to move forward, is there have been a lot of very successful companies that have been very lucrative investments that have been job killers, job destroyers, not job creators. Mitt so, Romney's not going to want you around. 
No, yeah. it, it, no I'm, I'm not talking about private equity. Yeah, Other, just it's just the nature of innovation. Yeah. A lot of it is how do you take something that you needed a thousand people and make it so you only need ten people. That so part of this is steering this back towards broader entrepreneurship all over the country, broader sectors. The things, mm. some of the things I mentioned, each have over a thousand jobs. Right. That's not accidental. I mean, they're, they're, what they're doing are creating valuable companies that are also creating great middle class jobs. So I think it's it's partly how it can start. What would you do? So startups can, in fact, save the American dream and broaden it to also how do startups help close, not ex widen the opportunity gap. Those questions work for you? Yeah, I, look, I let me just, if I were Wolf Blitzer, I would set it up, because he frequently does, with the following example. Um, when General Motors was bailed out, whatever you think about the bailout, it doesn't matter, but when General Motors was bailed out, of course, a big company was saved, and a lot of the union jobs in that big company were saved. But what were destroyed were actually more jobs in small businesses in communities all across the country. They were the suppliers, the car dealers, the little community companies. And more jobs were lost than all the General Motors union jobs saved. Nobody in Washington actually knew. They didn't say anything. And so what's going to be different? Because if we don't solve that equation, if we don't have in people's heads, I'm focused on the little auto dealer that's been a family owned business in Paducah for the last 50 years that just went out of business, our economy is not gonna grow and our middle class isn't gonna thrive. Lenny? So I, I can't wait for those questions to be asked of the 2016 candidates mostly because I'm going to see you asking them and you ask in an entertaining way. <laughs> but we don't need to wait for that. What I would do is, is you know, take these five topics and that question, can startups mm -hmm. save the American dream? And in every community in the country, I would get together the mayor, the head of the university, the head of the hospital, the head of the K-12 system, and three or four startups and spend a day and say, what are we doing to solve this problem, not waiting for the next president? Terrific. Thank you. Any quick thoughts, guys, before we go? That's good. Okay. Uh, yes, right here, uh, guy in yellow tie, and then the no yellow tie. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Jackson Mueller with the uh, Milken Institute, and my quick question uh, regards student debt and how much of a threat that is to entrepreneurship and whether it's in this book. I'm sorry if I, I haven't read it yet, but whether it's in here. What about student debt? Is it a... Factor, not a factor? Yes. We actually think about this a lot. I think one of the things that's really important to recognize is the way, and Silicon Valley is particularly bad at this, but no one anywhere is good at this. The way startups are structured, it's actually a pretty exclusive industry. So if you have student debt, and we, I mean, we at Village Cap, we actually have student loan forgiveness as an employee benefit, where a lot of companies will have, uh, so long as you work for a startup like us, you can have your student loans forgiven as long as you're with us. Whereas a lot of people talk about startups having pool tables and free catering and all of that. Um, we hear all the time from people who have huge amounts of student debt saying, I would love to start a company or I'd love to join a startup and I don't mind making $24,000 a year in a, in a vacuum, but when I've got this big student loan, I've got to stay at this job that I hate and that's a big business job. And so. For startups to be more inclusive and for anybody in the country to say, I want to join or start a company, being able to, student debt is the single biggest barrier that keeps a lot of people who want to join or start companies from getting in there. I mean, you've hit one of the big taboo subjects about where education fits in all this, what you pay for. Haram, Jaggi, where are you? Haram's a, a dropped out, right? You, you never went back. What's your student debt load? Zero, because you left and you've gone out to become your entrepreneur. So Peter Thiel is out there doing it, but it's a controversial. From the Atlantic Monthly, we write a lot about this subject, about how the educational system and, and everything from student loan debt, but the return on investment that students are getting from this is something that is increasingly, uh, uh, I, I think, being weighed in new and different ways. So I think it's an important question. Yes, sir, right here. The man without the yellow tie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is David. I'm an entrepreneur and an owner of a small business. In my business, there's no magic. There's nothing that I can patent. There's no innovation, just hard, solid work. My story doesn't hit the paper. How do you amplify 
stories like me because what he continues are the innovation that changed the world and I changed the world of my people who work for me over 70 people right. day by day their life changed because they continue to support the client and it's not sexy it's just hard solid work yeah why why are you in the media you, you know what <laughs> it's not your fault that, let's go but, have some coffee that, that question <laughs> thank you for asking that because that's really what um we were trying to get at in this celebrating entrepreneurship and I, I said in my opening remarks that yes, Mark Zuckerberg is wonderful and yes, God love him, Steve Case is wonderful, but you're wonderful too. So is the corner taqueria, so is the dry cleaner, so is the nail salon, all entrepreneurs, unsung heroes who go build something and help other people have lives. I started a little nine person real estate firm. And I do think that we need a change in, it, entrepreneurship has become a sexy word. Innovation has become exciting. But the truth is the engine that powers this economy day in and day out is just as much, if not more, people like you. And I think we've sort of lost sight of that. I mean, if we look, Steve mentioned immigration. I mean, if you look at our economy since our founding as a nation, wave after wave of immigrant community has made their living and built their middle class dream by starting little stores. If you look at the economy today, women owned businesses, minority owned businesses, they're some of the fastest growing segments of the economy. In other words, Building a business, whether it's sexy or not, whether it's just hard work, is the path to a better life, not just for the entrepreneur, but for the people they employ. And we but have to make that heroic. Just to, to build on that, uh, last year I probably met two or 3,000 entrepreneurs in dozens of cities, and I'm inspired by all their stories. My favorite story, and Steve happened to be with us in Minneapolis, was Enrique Garcia a Mexican immigrant who moved to Minneapolis as a dishwasher and was given the opportunity to open up a little tamale stand, which got popular, you know, got number one Yelp review, then goes in you know, Minnesota magazines. Now he's got like three or four of them and now, sell, now freezing them and selling them in, in supermarkets. And when I was talking to him, he, looking in his eyes, he could have the next Chipotle. And Chipotle, by the way, creates lots of jobs, it's also worth $20 billion. So these little ideas, you know, what, how would Chipotle, if somebody came to me 10 years ago, so we're gonna create this thing, and what's, it, what's the intellectual property about that? It's like a burrito. But there's something about that burrito that ended up being like, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs in a company worth $20 billion. There was something about that idea, something about that brand, something about that experience, and obviously something about that, that food. That's the story of American entrepreneurship. It's all, all these different sectors of the economy. The challenge is, how do you make sure more Enriques have the shot? Because most who want to think, I have a pretty good like, tamale. Nobody's giving them the opportunity. And if they have one that's successful, how do they get the capital to the second or third? That's where crowdfunding can become important. And if they're showing signs of life and really want to then franchise it or expand, how do they raise that growth capital? That's where a lot of people kind of you know, come off the rails because they don't have that same opportunity, particularly in the middle of the country where all the capital is really on the, on the coast. Crowdfunding will help, more awareness will help, telling more stories will help, but it's all these different mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, all these different ideas, all these different businesses that collectively drive our economy. And, and people like you, the reason the regulatory roadmap is important on top of everything Steve just said, and this data has been repeated over and over again in multiple studies. 70%, 70% of small business owners like you describe government as hostile to them. Hostile. So in other words, they believe that the environment in which they're working hard and trying to operate and trying hopefully to grow their business is hostile to their efforts. That's a problem. We're right at the end. I would simply say to the gentleman here, that no matter how unsexy you think their business is, I can tell you as a guy who's, who's been in this field where there's always a good story there. You know, there's always a good story. There's always, you know, something along the line with your workers, what you do, how you organize what you do, healthcare. I've, I've got to bring it to a close. We can talk at lunch, but I want to thank so much everyone. Thank you for talking through this work.
Ken Startup Save the American Dream, Steve Case, Carly Fiorina, Ross Baird, Brian Meese, and Lenny Mendoza. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's always good.